you know, this is a bit of a modern event, so we also have uh, people joining us in, in hybrid format. So uh, it's the first time I'm, I'm trying one of these events, and uh, I hope all goes well. Um, Ernst has assured me that uh, he, will, he will step in and help us on all of the technicals. So just sitting here today, um, I think it's really interesting that when we, when we look at what's going on around the world, we, uh, we're really uh, having this event against the backdrop of, a, of something of a perfect storm in European electricity markets. And we also see this uh, having ramifications around the world. And we've also seen that China's power markets are having their own issues, but also link into our issues here. Now, of course, there are very many things going on in the electricity market. We see some of this links into uh, renewables. Some of this links into perhaps questions on energy efficiency. There are specific questions on the gas market. There are questions also on geopolitics. And then, of course, there are also social concerns. And we touched upon some of these issues uh, previously. Lord Stern spoke about some of these challenges that we see. Now, I think the key point here is, of course, the argument is not that we should abandon the climate transition because we see frictions. Rather, to my mind, the question is, how can we engage policy action now to ensure that these frictions don't become more severe in the future? And also, very importantly, be cognizant of the fact that the transition will have uh, frictions in it. There will be some unintended consequences and how we can ensure that we manage these uh, consequences and these issues. Now, I'm delighted today to be joined by a very distinguished panel. And uh, I, won't, I won't take up time with panel introductions. So I'll jump right in. And uh, I'd like to start off with uh, EU Director General uh, for Climate Action, Mauro Petriconi. Um, and just ask the question on prices. Let's uh, come back to this question of, of carbon pricing. Now, markets are getting very excited about carbon prices. We've seen that over the past few weeks. And um, we see that pricing is clearly a very important pillar in the EU's Fit for 55 program. So, Mauro, I wonder, can you give us a, a bit of a state of play on where we are on Fit for 55? what we can expect over the coming quarters, and also maybe just zooming in on this price dimension, share some of your thoughts also both in terms of the, the risks. We've touched upon inflation and some of the concerns there. It was a question earlier. But perhaps also some of the opportunities that this can rise. Over to you. Thank you very much. And first of all, thanks for the invitation to this panel. And it's very hard to be the first to take the floor after Nick Stern. Um, and uh, I would be very tempted just to say that uh, uh, he has once again expressed with enormous clarity uh, what we are trying to do, and uh, and leave it at that. But I'll try I'll try to answer your question as brief as I can. I mean, carbon pricing is the backbone of our system. It's not the only element. We do have a combination of carbon pricing, regulation, standards, investment and social measures. So it's the whole package that Nick Stern was talking about. But carbon pricing is at the core. Carbon pricing versus carbon tax for Europe, it was a pragmatic choice. Uh, given our institutional setup, if we were, uh, if we had chosen to go for a carbon tax, we're probably still debating it uh, instead of having had a carbon price for now uh, more, you know, 17 years. It doesn't always work the way we wanted, uh, but it has prompted already, even in times of very low prices, uh, power generation and industry in Europe to make the right choice. Uh, power generation started decarbonizing early. We've had for a long time, four or five percent decrease in emissions every year. And industry has invested in energy efficiency improvements. Uh, which have helped also its competitiveness. And uh, uh, in 2019, the first uh, pre, the last pre-pandemic year, we had a reduction of emissions also around four, five, four and a half percent. So industry also started investing in more radical um, uh, technology change. Um, all, all that to say that without carbon pricing uh, of some sort, 
uh, an effective carbon price, you cannot have a serious climate and energy policy. Uh, and um, once we've chosen the the, uh, the market as an instrument, as I said, more for a pragmatic reason than anything else, uh, we're now trying to make the most of its uh, advantages, which is flexibility and, and the ability of companies to plan uh, their investment around avoiding the carbon price. Uh, now, uh, we managed to strengthen the price signal already um, before the fifth of 55 package through, you know, we had suffered from a glut of uh, certificates uh, because of the uh, fall in emission after the financial crisis. Uh, we had in the system international credits of very dubious value. All that is gone. Uh, we've introduced automatic mechanisms to regulate liquidity in the market and prices have uh, started rising relatively fast. It is true we've seen a big increase this year from about 30, 25, 30 euros a ton at the beginning of the year to uh, around 60. The last auction uh, today or yesterday was 58 points out. Um, if you look at our calculations, this has to rise. Uh, this has to go up over the decade, uh, and that's why the uh, proposal to strengthen the system, because at the end of the day, uh, without uh, a sufficient price signal, uh, people will not invest in decarbonization. Now, for us, investing in decarbonization means investing in new technologies, means investing in state-of-the-art technologies, also means investing in regenerating our industrial apparatus and making it modern and competitive, something which we, uh, we, we, we need. So the 50 of 55 is articulated around this, but it also is a huge aspect of uh, targets, targets on uh, renewables, targets on energy efficiency, targets on CO2 emissions of cars, um, regulation, uh, investment, the point that Nick Stein was making at the end, that we need to grow out of the pandemic, but we, we have a choice on which kind of growth we have, uh, is at the heart of the uh, European Green Deal, uh, the way we have uh, agreed our new seven years budget and the next generation EU program. Um, the green recovery, uh, which is a recovery, it's, an, it's a strategy of economic growth, is, is, is essential. So it, it's a complex package. We now are uh, at the stage of explaining it, explaining its interactions, explaining its complexity. And uh, we're looking forward to um, the beginning of political discussion with member states. There's one aspect which is emerging as more and more crucial in that, and that is of uh, um, the just transition but just transition has many aspects. There is an issue of solidarity within Europe, a large solidarity between member states. Uh, there is an issue of uh, solidarity between regions, which sometimes cut across national borders. And there is increasing an issue of solidarity between within our societies. Uh, and the point that you were making for the energy prices is, uh, goes to the heart of that. To us, it's clear that the, the current spike in energy prices is not caused by the, uh, the carbon price. It's caused by the dynamic of the, of the gas markets. But that doesn't diminish the seriousness of the problem, and it underscores the fact that a transformation of this magnitude, something which necessarily will pass to increase energy prices in the short to medium term, although we did not expect this kind of spikes, uh, needs to be managed. Needs to be managed because there are parts of the society that can afford um, uh, these increases. They should afford these increases because we have not priced the real cost of the cheap energy that we've had so far. Uh, but there are parts of the society that whoever is the responsibility, whatever the justness of the of the policy, simply cannot afford to stand up to it. Uh, and I think we have to 
uh, protect that part of the society. And uh, given what's happening in the, in the energy market, uh, that job begins uh, right now. Um, we see uh, the uh, in the longer term, our policy not only as one of fighting climate change. Uh, in Europe, this policy has such roots because it has many uh, uh, many motivations. Uh, I will simply recall that we've had uh, um, energy crisis, uh, or at least since the 70s, of uh, uh, varying uh, gravity, uh, and we're going to have more in the future. The only way for Europe to manage them is to increase our resilience to the shocks, increase our energy independence, increase energy security. And uh, in a continent like Europe, even if you forget climate change and decarbonization, renewables are the, the only way to go to. So we have the right policies for the long term. The challenge now is how do you articulate uh, that long term policy uh, with the inevitable obstacles that you find in the short term. And some of them are economic in nature, and they can be solved uh, uh, with investment. Uh, some of them are social in nature. Uh, they're much more delicate, uh, more difficult to tackle. They do require an expenditure of resources. But they don't require an enormous amount of expenditure. Uh, the last point I would like to make in terms of, you know, where, where are the biggest problems in terms of energy prices for uh, for citizens, for instance? I put aside the industry for a moment. Um, buildings. The energy bill for heating and cooling our homes in a climate which is changing with harsher winters and hotter summers. Uh, but there are already 35 million Europeans unable to pay the bills. So there's already a problem to be solved now. Uh, the long-term answer is uh, building renovation, energy efficiency, insulation. Uh, the short-term answer is to oblige uh, those who can afford the renovation to do so, support credit for those who can't afford to obtain credit in doing so, and simply support the income of those who can't afford uh, a renovation in the first place. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. There's a number of proposals on the table, notably that on a social climate fund that will be fed by the revenues of emission trading. Um, and um, we hope to have soon to move away from the, the explanatory phase I discussed and start the real policy discussion with member states on all this. Thank you very much. And. Um, I think when we when we look at Europe today, indeed, we see uh, very big changes on the policy front happening. But of course, it's not just um, on the Commission side we see these changes. We also see a, a lot of change coming on the central bank front. And indeed, uh, 2022 will mark a, a very important year for Europe. We're going to have the ECB presenting the details on the climate dimension of the new monetary policy strategy. And I think also very importantly, um, we will see the first round of ECB bank stress tests uh, on a, on a bottom-up exercise. We've already seen some exercises taking shape in 2020 and, and uh, seen some results coming out last year as well. So I think these are going to be uh, very important uh, points for us to watch. Sabine Maudea, you are an executive board member at the Bundesbank, and I'd like to turn to you and ask you, which role do central banks play? Which role should central banks play in this equation? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and I thought that Nick already gave an answer. Well, we do, we are not the major player in town, but we have an important role. Let me put it that way. And I see the role of uh, central banks twofold. First of all, we all as central bankers have to reflect the impact of climate change on our mandates um, because, well, talk about financial stability, about price stability, uh, banking supervision, this all is affected by climate change. And our second role is definitely to address the urgency to act towards the governments or to the political decision and makers. Um, so I see our role twofold. Let me start with 
you know, reflect the impact of climate change on our mandate. Let's start with the core mandate is price stability. We just discussed it. We will see, you know, a price a dynamic um, due to, you know, climate policies, most probably. But we see, will also see, and we see that already in Brazil, that droughts and floods might also have an impact on food prices and, and uh, other prices. Um, we also uh, have to deal with financial stability. Central banks will have and do have already a look at the financial risk um, due to climate change. And we all are aware of the physical risk. We see floods like we had this year in Germany with a great uh, uh, financial impact. We see wildfires not only in Australia, California, but also in Europe. And uh, so this is a, a tremendous physical risk, but at the same time, we see also transitional risk. So the risk that the real economy uh, does not adjust easily towards uh, political decisions that may come too abrupt for them, right? And of course, we are also, some central banks are also dealing with um, banking supervision. So, of course, it's our task when um, doing banking supervision to ensure that the financial flows of the financial in industry gets sustainable, right? And this is our task. But let me turn to, I think, uh, a really important role, the role to address the urgency to act. Well, why, why is this our task. I see this as our task because, first of all, we do have the analytical capacity, and Robert uh, pointed it out very well in his introductory statement. Second, we do have, we are data owner. Third, we do have the credibility and the independency. So I think we have to play a role. So what does this precisely mean, addressing the urgency? Well, what are our means? And we have started uh, at the Network for Greening the Financial System. This is an international um, network of central banks and banking supervisions um, to deal with uh, climate change. And there we have started uh, to show different scenarios. So we did a scenario analysis, and uh, this year we will have a refined version of that. So what is this about the uh, scenario analysis? What are we doing there? We are showing different scenarios of political action, or rather inaction, and what is the outcome of this inaction for, from an economic perspective. What does that mean for GDP, price dynamics, inflation, and so on, right? Um, you mentioned that Europe has already done a lot of uh, far-reaching or make a lot of far-reaching decision. Many of you will be familiar with the decisions we just made this July. Um, I think this it was really a milestone, uh, what the uh, Euro system did there. And I think what we did there showed two things. First of all, we try to protect our own balance sheets. Um, since we do asset purchase programs, we do have a lot of on our balance sheets. And I think it's our task also to protect this balance sheet. And how do we do this? We do this in a way we expect this also from the financial industry. So we will analyze our financial risk that comes from the assets we do have on our balance sheets or that we take in as collateral. So how do we do this? What do we need? We certainly will ask for disclosure for, from the issuer of the securities we either take in as collaterals or um, that we will buy. We will also most probably have a closer look at rating agencies. Uh, we will be interested about the information that they take uh, to do credit ratings and many other things It will take too much time uh, to do, explain them. And of course, some of the decisions we make is also to lead by example. So what we do, for example, is we will uh, publish and disclose our carbon footprint for at least our carbon uh, for our corporate uh, portfolio. 
So this is about Europe, but of course, climate change is a global task, right? And therefore, and I initially mentioned it already, we as central banks um, already four or five years ago have realized that we have to work together, we have to collaborate. And that was the reason why we founded the Network for Greening the Financial System. So the idea was is to put our capacities together and to find ways how we're going to deal or analyze this new risk, not new, but to the central banks, uh, first time we dealt with it for a long time, um, how we're going to collaborate in this way. And now we are a network of 95 uh, members, uh, representing five continents. And what, what was the idea behind it? And that's the, the come back to your initial question, was the role of central banks. The idea of this international network was to bring climate change to the awareness of the central banks, to the central bank world. And this, I think, we manage very well. I think it is now on the agenda. So the question is what we will do in the future, because you said it's about now and not about the far future and not about the past. So what I think uh, what we will do at this international level at the central bank area is, first of all, we would like to be more integrated. So we will have a global perspective, also integrated developing countries. And the second thing is we will do more sandbox work. So we see ourselves as a laboratory, right? And I think, Robert, you said it think tank, right, was your term, I think. And uh, I think we, in the future, will deal with new uh, topics, not new, but uh, new to the center banks, like biodiversity, the impact of biodiversity on the economics, and several other uh, topics. Well, let me stop here. Maybe I put it in a nutshell. You asked me what is the role of the center banks. I think, first of all, central banks' mandates are affected by climate change, so we have to react. But most, I think the most important thing, the great service central banks can offer towards the society is really to urge the governments to act. So thank you very much. And indeed, uh, there's quite a list of topics that are popping up in our debate here today. I'd be keen to uh, pull in uh, Seila Pasir. Basilugo, I'm sorry, I'm probably not pronouncing that quite right, um, who's Director of Strategy, Policy and the Review Department at the IMF. And we see indeed um, that one of the big topics in the world today is still questions on fuel subsidies. We see this around the world. And uh, of course, it's quite striking to see just how many governments still have these in place. Also, um, we see uh, big discussions around how these can be removed, how we can manage these transitions. And again, we're back to that topic of the just transition. Uh, Sela, I'd like to ask you, what kind of work is the IMF doing on this? And perhaps if you could uh, bring in this global dimension by sharing with us some of the particular challenges you see here for the emerging and the developing economies. I don't know if we have Sela on the line here. Ah, uh, Sela, I think you're on mute. Can can the technical teams help by unmuting? What's the sign for muting? We can't hear you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm not, I haven't quite figured all of that out yet. Um, ah, there was a sound there. No taking pictures of me while I'm doing these elephant ear signs. That's just not allowed. <laughs> oh. Right. Sela, um, we can't hear you. I'm not sure if you can hear me now. Ah, fantastic. Yes, we can hear you now. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, 
Thank you, thank you so much. And many thanks to the Austin Central Bank and Twitter for inviting me to this very important discussion. I, uh, as you said, I wanted to talk about the need for fossil fuel subsidy reform and carbon pricing, which were mentioned um, uh, already now. At the fund, we have been advocating for a while now to get energy prices right, to reduce reliance on fossil fuels, and to facilitate transition toward renewables. And we just published a study um, which highlights that global fossil uh, fuel subsidies have increased in recent years, reaching around six trillion in 2020, up from an estimated 5.2 trillion in 2017. And just 8% of those of that total reflects explicit subsidies, which is basically undercharging for supply costs. 92% is actually implicit subsidies undercharging for environmental costs, about 70%, and foregone tax revenues. So I, I'm not going to go into detail, but uh, as I advertised, we just published a very comprehensive uh, study on this. And absent reforms, these costs and total global fossil fuel subsidies will increase further, undermining the important efforts uh, that are going on right now. So there is a clear need for fuel subsidy reform and implementing efficient fuel pricing, so letting uh, fuel prices uh, to reflect their true cost by renew removing these implicit and explicit subsidies could help cut global carbon dioxide emissions by well over a third by 2025, as you can see in this chart, and align mitigation efforts with the Paris Agreement to keep global warming to well below two degrees. And ending a fuel uh, subsidies would also prevent nearly a million premature deaths a year from dirty air and raise trillions of dollars for governments, nearly 4% of global GDP in revenue. So how do we get the price right? Um, carbon pricing is a very effective instrument to reduce emissions as revenues then can be used to compensate to the most effective and to finance a green transition. And I agree with Nick that this has to be part of a comprehensive package of overlapping policies in the six market failures, which he explained very eloquently. The fund has put forward an international carbon price uh, proposal, the ICPF as we call it, to uh, support global mitigation efforts. Agreement on an IC ICPF or a combination of equivalent policies among major economies including large emerging market developing economies is critical to succeed on mitigation. This proposal foresees participation by uh, five countries, Canada, China, India, UK, and US, plus the EU. And together, this accounts for two thirds of global emissions, including the other G countries, G20 countries would of course uh, take us to 85%. So to garner support for the ICPF, the pricing should be based on countries' development needs, as you mentioned about uh, emerging market countries, so a lower price floor for EMDs. What we have in mind is $75 per ton, a floor, uh, for uh, advanced economies, $50 per ton for high-income emerging market economies, and $25 per ton for low-income EMEs among the six largest emitters, and this would be adequate to keep the rise in global temperatures to under two degrees Celsius. So absent an agreement on such uh, an uh, ICPF or other type of uh, carbon uh, club, as uh, there is also a proposal from Germany, countries or economic blocks would unilaterally implement border carbon adjustments, the BCAAs, the BCAAs and this, uh, of course, um, would not be most effective as um, as coordinated approach to carbon pricing, and and uh, it could also be subject to legal challenges, as the WTO um, uh, already mentioned. So we have uh, recently released a paper examining policy design and implementation issues. For BCAs, and uh, in the in the um, interest of time, I'm not going to go uh, into more detail on this. I think we also need to think about data gaps. This was mentioned very well just by Sabine now, and also with, um, uh, from Nick. Uh, this requires standardized and comparable data for governments and market participants 
We're working on the G20 Data Gaps Initiative um, with other in the, in international institutions to address data gaps most relevant for policy making on climate change. Uh, it's the next slide, please. Um, we um, have put together with, of course, uh, many others uh, that have been working on these issues, uh, a climate information architecture, which really needs to be uh, strengthened. I'm sure we'll hear more about this later to have a pre predictive um, flexibility as, one, as was very well mentioned earlier and to make sure that there is uh, disclosure standards and principles for sustainable finance classifications. This would, of course, facilitate the pricing of climate change related risks, support sustainable finance markets, and enable regulators to gauge system-wide risks. We are working very closely with our World Bank and OECD colleagues to develop high-level principles for sustainable finance classifications and, uh, of course, NGFS and the G20 uh, study group on sustainable finance. So really important work going on on the climate information architecture, I, I think, uh, will really pave the way for um, private sector to be able to finance uh, the important uh, investment needs. Finally, on the issue you mentioned about, about uh, emerging markets, I already mentioned the differentiated responsibilities for combating climate change and different policies. And so that's number one, um, uh, to recognize the differentiated responsibilities and support uh, developing economies. A second important element, as Nick mentioned, is the climate financing to enable them to fund adaptation efforts and the transition to low carbon economy. And um, in regards to our role on this, we don't provide project finance, that's not the role nor the mandate of the fund, but we already incorporate policy reform priorities in our lending uh, for climate adaptation. We work on surveillance, we work on capacity development, and going forward, the $650 billion SDR allocation has provided the emerging markets with additional fiscal space, which could be used for this purpose, as well as just today, actually, um, very soon, our board will discuss proposals for voluntary rechanneling of these SDRs, including possibly to set up a resilience and sustainable trust, the RST, which could be used to help countries address long-term structural challenges importantly, um, climate change. So with that, I hand over to you and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. So thank you very much, Sayla. And I, I know you need to run out at 4 p.m. So what I thought I'd do is just open up and give everyone an opportunity to ask a question or two at this stage. Um, but I'll throw in my own question for you, which I plan to ask everyone else at the end of the panel, which is what would be your climate wish for 2022? My climate wish for 2022 is that the um, multilateral institutions come together and coordinate on this very important agenda because they do have an important role to play. So collaboration among us, I think, is expected. And for my part, we will do all we can to do so. Sounds very good. Are there questions in the audience, either here in Vienna or Ernest uh, via chat? Please go ahead. Um, yes, uh, we have one question. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much for the intervention regarding uh, disclosure of uh, information regarding green information. Uh, my question would, is um, in the European Union, EU taxonomy is already in place. Would be this the best practice model for other countries and regions? So I don't know, uh, Mauro, if you would like to pick up on this or uh, everyone feel free to, to jump in, please. I'm happy to say a word, but I'd be curious about uh, others' views as well. Um, taxonomy could be a model, perhaps not identical, but uh, because it is the one we've written, it's uh, very influenced by um, the debate in our society. 
but the principle I think is the right one. But just to be clear, the taxonomy isn't an absolute uh, standard. Taxonomy is uh, a consensus on what today means having a very green economic activity. And a taxonomy is born by the desire to give an instrument to investors to show that their activities are sustainable and for uh, stakeholders to make sure, for citizens to make sure that when they invest in an economic activity, when they invest in a company, uh, because they want to make a sustainable investment, um, they know what we're talking about. Uh, it has also a broader value. It's becoming a reference element uh, which goes beyond the, uh, the transparency in, in private financial markets. Um, and it could be an extremely useful role, uh, but that has to be uh, calibrated because, uh, for instance, when it comes to public expenditure, uh, today public expenditure cannot go to activity, only to activities which are already entirely sustainable. We need to finance a transition from where we are today to where we want to be in 2050, which is net zero. So there are technologies, there are activities which are helpful for the transition and which deserve support, which deserve public and private investment, uh, uh, we should say so. The taxonomy is a good example of where you want to get in terms of activities which are um, uh, essentially sustainable and as a backstop, uh, in any event, respect the principle of, of do no harm. Did you want to? Well, I could only second what Mauro said. It, the taxonomy, first of all, should the Commission should be commended for having been upfront on creating something. Secondly, it does a number of very specific things. You've just mentioned them all. But it should also be said, and you said this, Mara, what it doesn't do. It doesn't give us an instrument, a standard for channeling capital into the transition, which if you look at the, at the overall challenge that Nick laid out so nicely, is of course the critical piece. So I think it's very important to, to say what the taxonomy does, commend the Commission for having done that, having been upfront uh, at the global level, but also, as, as Mauro just did, lay out clearly what it doesn't do. And I think the Commission has a task here uh, in front of itself to think about how do, you, how do you address the transition needs, which if you look at the scale of it all, of course, is the primary challenge and the more we can do that at a global level, uh, this goes back to Sayla's point about the multilateral cooperation, the better it will be to find a way to help uh, private capital to mobilize into the transition. Anis, did we have a, another question? Sorry, I'm, I'm looking at you, Philip, but I'm, I can't see Anis. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm hidden, sorry. Yeah. Uh, we, we have a question uh, about distributional consequences. Uh, whether makeup payments, which is a usual economic recipe, uh, would be a way to go, and how this might be engineered at the global level. Thank you. Sela, would you like to jump in on this? Just uh, very quickly, and also um, on the a point that was uh, on the question from before, um, which is what I mentioned, the work that we're doing with the World Bank and OECD, to develop high-level principles, because there are taxonomies from different parts of the world. The EU has its taxonomy, um, and China has its taxonomy, so there are various taxonomies, and I think it's important to have, and they, as, as was very well said, they need to um, reflect country-specific and um, uh, region-specific um, uh, consensus, but I do think we need to also have a way of um, having high-level principles that guide these taxonomies because of the cross-border nature of uh, investment. Um, so that's uh, on that one. On um, just transition, yes, uh, this is one of the issues um, that, is, that we are looking at and studying carefully and having it at uh, make-up payments at a global level, but also other ways of uh, introducing taxation and um, redistribution of revenues to those that really 
are most impacted by it by monitoring and um, targeting carefully where those um, uh, uh, payments could go. So yes, uh, very much agreed that this needs to be uh, put together as a global initiative given the uh, uh, also the trade and other uh, interlinkages across countries. Thank you very much, Sela, and, and thank you so much also for having taken time to, to join us here today. So we've spoken a lot about investment, and of course we've also touched a little bit upon technology. And I think this is a great time to bring in Professor List, who is uh, uh, leading AVL List, uh, a company of uh, 11,000 employees, and as I understand, with lots of wonderful scientists and technicians who are working on many of these technologies that we'll need both today and in the future. Uh, Professor List, uh, when we look at the challenges for investment, how do you think about that? What are some of the issues that, to your mind, are important to, to drive the technology forward today? Well, it is truly a very um, dramatic situation today with uh, the CO2 uh, concentrations in the atmosphere increasing every year. And also this year, again, we see an increase. This has been going on for 50 years. So it is really dramatic to move forward. And I think there's a lot of movement forward, uh, but it's also challenging because the transition We've been working for this for many a number of years, and the set of change has increased very fast over the last uh, five years, I should say, to call for electrification. And even though we have provided for a number of years in research, did our first hybrid some 20 years ago, did uh, our first electric vehicle some 10 years ago, and uh, uh, so did our first, started our uh, research laboratory on fuel cell also some uh, almost 20 years ago. Uh, the speed that's taking place now in the, uh, in the electrification is very fast. Even though we are quite well positioned, we have already 60% of our cells volume is in electrification. Uh, and we are typically, to talk about our business model, we are provider of engineering, the work, to the, uh, to the uh, global OEMs, particularly in Europe and also tier ones in the, uh, or in the work of uh, cars and trucks and other vehicles. Uh, and as such, uh, we need to fulfill the requirements as defined by the law. These are typically CO2 uh, levels, used to be emission levels, still are, but that's for the side of, 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 of internal combustion engines, which was a big part of the past, but we have well transitioned to the level that today we have 60% of sales volume is in electrification uh, solutions, both uh, research and development work we execute, but also all the test systems and all the uh, simulation tools that exist that are so important today uh, already adapted to also the electrification needs. So it was just a big transition and we are still right in the middle of it. Uh, what happened at the same time that often, let's say, uh, contract funding, research funding uh, from the OEMs uh, were kind of slowed down quite a bit, have come back again. So uh, we are going to see good growth again next year. And uh, so it's a it's a challenging time, but also an exciting time. What does it mean? We have to, we have our own, typically we can uh, take on jobs uh, to support our customers in their transition into electrification of all kinds. Electrification has several avenues. It's battery electric. It is also hybrid and, uh, and plug-in hybrid. I would put under this also, uh, but also fuel cells are very important. And even in the truck area, you see avenues towards uh, uh, hydrogen being used also in engines, uh, but also above all in fuel cells. So there we see the truck area, for instance, uh, we see a big variety of, of different solutions that are competing with each other. In the passenger car, it's pretty much straightforward towards battery electric, 
with some degree of hybridization, which I think has a uh, good valid is a valid approach to uh, increase the broad basis for electrification and allow fast electrification on that partial level, which still is very effective to bring down CO2. So the, the challenges for us as a private company is that we do our in-house research and development, which is about 10% of our sales volume that allows to build the, the technology we need and then make business in executing all these programs and also supplying laboratories and test systems in this field. That's our business model. And we've been growing over many years, typically 10, 12% per year. Uh, 2020 was the first year of COVID, which of course did affect us. Our sales volume came down. Uh, this year we are growing slightly. Next year we see big growth again. Uh, and uh, as such, we see that uh, it's important for us to understand also where legislation is going. And uh, today we are fully focused on meeting the CO2 goals for our customers and support them in this way. So, so much for our business model. Uh, can you repeat again your question, your specific questions you had? So essentially, what, um, so you, first of all, thank you very much. You, you've touched upon many of the issues. I suppose one of the big questions is, uh, what would you see on the, the policy front which could help foster more technological innovation today? Are there some things that the policymakers are doing that perhaps they shouldn't be doing? Or are there some things they're not doing that we would like them to see do? Well, I think... Uh... Typically, we would support very much uh, a kind of openness towards technology. But I do also understand that when it comes to in the passenger care areas, electrification is a good way forward. I fully believe that. Uh, uh, and by deciding in that direction, clearly is also a way to, to take out some of the options, which I think one might regret at first sight, but also to understand that we need to build momentum, we need to build concentration, and as such, it does make sense to focus on electrification as is being done today. When it comes to, let's say, the uh, field of trucks and other heavier vehicles, it's not that simple. Uh, it's not clear whether electrification is a good way forward for, for instance, uh, uh, commercial vehicles of a smaller size or medium drugs is still reasonable to do electrification. When it comes to long haul, we have to evaluate different solutions. And today in the industry, you see both uh, uh, pure electric, you see also uh, the move towards hydrogen and uh, very strongly, and it's very much supported by the European Union, and it is very much uh, in the forefront uh, for the future. And here we have to see when can it put forward, when will it be fully com competitive, and how does it will the share of the technology be between the different avenues. And there we need an openness to different technologies where the solution will partially be hydrogen used in uh, internal combustion engines. That's absolutely valid. Would be CO2. Hydrogen, of course, is CO2 neutral uh, and is a good way forward. And then at the same time, we have invested a lot in fuel cells. I'm happy to do this work also. So there is a, a good example of a valid openness of technology, I think. And we see that this competition is done. And here we also see that we, uh, we uh, see that support should be given in that case. In that case, in this specific case of the truck, I think it would not be quite right to say it's not okay to burn hydrogen in internal combustion engines. 
even though they don't have a good reputation, because it's a very valid way to go forward. And it could be the fastest way to forward. But and then on the other side, if it's forbidden, uh, then there's a concern, is it something we could invest to? I think we should, here is a good example, again, where we should be open. And technology, the freedom of te technological choice should be there. I think the government should set uh, clearly uh, what is the policy, uh, what is the important uh, laws that protect the, the, the societal needs. That is very clear. But then the choice should be left to the industry and to the researchers to find the best way forward. So that's a, uh, that's a point I would like to make in this specific area of, of trucks, for instance. And I think it's understood that it should go that way. But sometimes, uh, in general, uh, it is a very important principle because uh, research, if you really believe truly in research, it is by definition not predictable what the outcomes are. We see very quick changes over time in different directions. And the openness of research is very, a very open principle. Uh, so that I would expect from, from policy in general. Uh, then I think what is also very important that research investment in companies is supported. Uh, this can be by tax means, uh, which I think is done uh, quite well in Austria, I have to say that. Uh, it's also has different forms in different countries. It's a very important principle. It should be supported. Uh, and then, of course, what I think is a great uh, act of maybe uh, not, spe not specific policy, but it's a, a direction which all governments agree in Europe. And we have, the, I think, the great example of the European research, European frameworks, the uh, Horizon 2020, which has just ended, and the Horizon Europe, which is just in the, has started already successfully. We has, as a company, very much, I think, participated. I think we also could contribute from time to time very well in participating in these uh, research programs uh, very much. And it has helped us a lot to develop technologies early on and come with solutions when they are needed. Also in this phase of electrification and the huge transition we are making, European research programs are very important. And also here we uh, expect the, a good, uh, high need of openness. There are some limitations which uh, we take as what they are. That's, that's okay. Uh, but overall, we see a good openness and that is very, good, very great. The key is that it really helps us to, to fulfill our customers, their needs, uh, to be very competitive for the world market. And uh, so I think that is one of the policies. Of course, you have the many uh, organizations that are present here have their play of uh, regulations and of how they with their policies do it. We don't, as a company, and maybe our customers, uh, the car companies and truck companies, uh, don't realize that how much of a, let's say, sophisticated and a hugely important uh, play there is between the different players as you are here in this, hall, in this room. Uh, uh, but we see the effect, of course, in the end. Uh, for us, it comes in more simple ways in kind of legislation we have to fulfill with our future solutions. Thank you very much. And indeed, I, I think you raise a, a very important point, both in terms of the question of making sure that we don't uh, set legislation to predetermine technologies, that we have that technological openness. But I also think you raise a, a very interesting point on the educational aspects, which it strikes me is important both in terms of developing the new technologies, but also just in ensuring the mobility of the labor markets. I mean, one of the things 
that always strikes me is when you look at educational outcomes in countries, education is a big determinant also for social mobility and hence for social equality. And we see that both uh, education uh, as far as, uh, as children are concerned, but also lifelong learning could be key in making sure that uh, people can move between different sectors. Because of course, when we think about the climate transition, it's very much a, a, a sectoral shift. Thank you. Thank you for those points, Professor. And uh, I'm a little bit conscious of time, and I, don't, I know that Mauro has to run out, but I don't want him to run out before he's given us his climate wish. So, Mauro, would you just want to jump in and give us your climate wish for 2022 before we have to, to uh, let you run to your next meeting? Um, it's easy to express, perhaps a little bit more difficult to do. I wish that by the end of next year, our legislators will have put together the package that we have presented. Not, perhaps not identical, probably not identical, but a package that does the trick of uh, uh, letting us get to 55% um, uh, reduction in emission 2030. You know, the point that Nick Stern was making, many misunderstand uh, what we need to do in, in, in this decade. We don't have to do everything but we have to do, uh, we have to lay the basis for the transition. We have to do the investment, we have to deploy the technologies, we have to take the policy and measures that will lead us to the transition over the next 30 years. So if we can do that um, uh, over the, uh, the next 12 months, um, we will all be very, very happy. Thank you very much for, uh, uh, for inviting me to this. It was a great discussion. And I'm sorry, I, I cannot see the end of it. So thank you very much for joining us. And, and I think uh, it's, it's a very good wish to have. Um, I think that's the whole point of wishes. We don't always know if they come true, uh, but there are certainly uh, good things to have with us. Philip Hinderland, you are a vice chairman in the, one of the world's largest, if not the largest asset manager. And um, what we've seen is uh, quite a lot of excitement in the markets around green investment. In fact, uh, we're beginning to talk about some potential bubbles in green assets. And um, it seems to me that there are, there are different variations around this bubble thematic. There's one which relates to concern that investors are, are, are running behind what is still a, a, a fairly low supply of these assets. There's concern as well about issues like greenwashing, that perhaps there could be uh, some problems ahead on this road. And then perhaps there's a further concern on how we make sure that we get the funds also to where they're needed. One of the things that really strikes me today is I see uh, a number of companies looking to Scandinavia, going into Scandinavia, um, looking for renewable energy sources. Whereas one could wonder, wouldn't it make more sense to go into some emerging economies and develop those renewable energy sources that we actually don't have yet? How do you think about this uh, as, as an investor and, and how can we think about these challenges? Thank you, Michaela. I don't see the left side of the room, so I'm going to get up because when I finally see real people, uh, it's nice just to actually see them face to face. So, Mikhail, I think your points are very well taken. And if I had to summarize one sentence that lies behind everything we do at BlackRock uh, on the sustainability front, it's really that we believe that we are at the beginning of what will very likely be the largest reallocation of uh, capital in our lifetime. That is the root, the foundation, if you like, of our entire strategy around uh, sustainable investing. This tectonic shift of capital has begun. During the last two years, and I'll give you some internal numbers here, we have already seen very significant flows on our own platform into sustainable investment products. This year alone, our clients have invested nearly $200 billion uh, of capital into our sustainable product offering. And we have thereby doubled in one year, our sustainable asset base from 200 billion to 400 billion dollars. Now, not surprisingly, we're also starting to see the impact of these flows on the real economy. And this is a point, of course, that Nick uh, raised several times earlier today. Uh, a growing gap in the cost of capital um, between green and brown companies has emerged. And I view this as a very promising 
uh, development. For companies favored, and again, I'll give you some internal uh, measures here. For companies favored by BlackRock's low carbon transition readiness framework, for example, the cost of capital has been lowered by as much as 40 basis points, which is pretty significant in a very short uh, period of time. Now, as you, as you mentioned, Mikhail, some have called this uh, or are worried about a green asset bubble in the making. But such a view assumes the past is a good guide to the future. And, and as the investment small print says, uh, it isn't in this particular case. For today is one of those rare moments in history when we know not just that the future will look very different to the past, we also know how it will be different in the sense that we know that net, the net zero economy will arrive. The science of climate change, as you have shown us, Nick, is irrefutable. Um, as one of my colleagues has recently said in an internal meeting, once you've seen the data, you can't unsee it. Um, the physics are there. There's nothing we can do about it in terms of denying it. It is irrefutable. The economic and human costs of our current linear economic growth model and the associated continued carbon emissions are so great that governments will act. We do not know precisely how. And we, don't, we do not know precisely when, but the net zero world will arrive. In that context, the price of and constraints on emitting carbon are going to rise to truly tra transformative levels in coming decades. The transition to a net zero economy is a decades long process and will impact every region, every economy, and every sector, and ultimately, likely, every company one way or another. Although what we are seeing at the moment may feel like a rapid acceleration, it is in fact only the beginning of one of the biggest structural changes the global economy has ever undergone. I, I believe that the only comparable structural transformation would have been in the 19th century when we introduced fossil fuel into the global economy. And, and in a sense, I guess what we're doing now, Nick, is we're kind of trying to reverse engineer uh, what happened back then. It means that investments that looked safe in the past could be existentially risky in the future. And investments that looked very risky in the past will turn out, could turn out to be very much resilient. Investors are therefore doing what they always do and frankly, what they should be doing. They're looking at risk adjusted returns. Once you see that, it is clear that the reduction in the cost of capital for green companies is a mere foothill before the mountain ahead. To say uh, that there is a green bubble, uh, in my view, is therefore to ignore the coming vast economic and financial transition to net zero that has only just begun. Sustainable investments today are only a small, a very small part of the global investment universe. They're growing very rapidly. Our sustainable assets are growing much more quickly than the overall asset base. But if you look at the stock, not, not at the flow, you will see that uh, they make up only a very small part of the global investment universe. We are so far witnessing only the beginning of a massive capital reallocation. As more investors become alert to these new risks, and show a preference for sustainable investments, we will see more flows into investments that are aligned with net zero. The IPCC estimates that about 50 to $100 trillion in capital investment is needed to achieve net zero by 2050. To put this into perspective, this is the equivalent of at least 10 Marshall plans a year uh, for three decades. On the other side of the equation, companies that fail over time to align themselves to net zero, uh, to a net zero economy will pay an increasing price. And the same, of course, holds true in our business for investment managers. Investment companies that fail to enable investors and clients to manage these new risks and seize the new opportunities will be left behind. So as a fiduciary to our clients, we have a duty to inform them of the risks just like we help them navigate uh, traditionally interest rate risk, earnings risk, credit risk, uh, we have the exact same responsibility to do that with sustainability risk and help them, enable them to manage, um, to, uh, to manage the climate transition risks. 
You asked me what is needed to support sustainable finance longer term. And here I very much, I think, am aligned with Nick Stern's lecture this morning. And I would point to three critical priorities. First of all, governments must follow up on their generic commitment to net zero by charting out a path on how they will get there. To do that, they can resort, I think uh, very much, uh, very glad you mentioned this, Nick, today. They can resort to several measures or instruments, levers. They can resort to pricing mechanisms. Some countries won't, I can tell you that right now. Uh, they can resort to standards, or they can resort to direct regulation or even intervention. And I was very glad to hear you put some perspective on the extreme focus uh, on carbon pricing, particularly when you think about the US uh, political situation. Second, data and analytics are key. Data and analytics to assess real exposures to the transition to net zero, data and analytics to price exposures to the transition, and data and analytics to construct portfolios that manage those risks and seize the opportunities in the transition. Third, and in my view critically, and Michaela, you, you raised this in your question, we must not forget that the transition to net zero has to be a global effort, and that means bringing emerging countries along on the transition. Emerging countries are not only the most impacted by climate change in many cases, they are also least able to afford the consequences and need support to meet the challenge of building net zero and a net zero economy. Far from reducing emissions, emerging markets are on track to see their emissions grow at even faster rates in the decades ahead. If this comes to pass, the entire world will face unprecedented levels of climate risk, extreme heat, flooding, wildfires, and other uh, natural catastrophes. Achieving the net zero transition in emerging economies will require investment in green technology and infrastructure at an unprecedented scale. Investments in low carbon projects in emerging market economies will need to total more than a trillion dollars a year. And Michaela, that is something like more than six times the currently 150 billion rate of investments that we're seeing going into the emerging world. One of the main barriers to private investments in emerging countries is the high risk profile of these countries. Addressing the root cause of country risk would require institutional and structural reforms, which in many cases are underway, but they will not deliver the needed level of de-risking on any relevant time horizon, as we have seen earlier in the next presentation. We therefore need to reimagine how we currently deploy climate finance in emerging markets. This inevitably implies a game-changing attitude on the part of the advanced economies that can afford it to step up massively their funding efforts vis-a-vis -vis the emerging world. They will need to lend more and put more public capital at risk, a point that uh, Sabina made earlier. Public capital from developed economies can absorb losses that would otherwise deter private investments. By sharing some of the risks that deter private investors from investing at all, governments can help projects in emerging markets be a realistic proposition for private finance. This is a necessary and worthwhile investment by the advanced economies. The climate disaster facing emerging markets will not be contained to just those countries. It impacts us all. And without global action, you heard it from Saylor earlier, governments of advanced economies will continue to bear massive costs from a warming planet. The transition to a net zero economy is a decades long process. While what we are seeing at the moment may feel like a rapid acceleration, it is only the beginning of this change. So uh, I really want to leave, and I guess I can answer my wish to you right at this point. It really is that we rethink completely how we mobilize capital to go into the emerging world. And I think, as you said, Nick, the MDBs, um, and the NDBs uh, are at the forefront of this discussion. And I would very much hope that the upcoming meetings next week, the annual meetings of the Fund and the World Bank can be a moment to really put this squarely on the table and recognize that we need a tenfold increase essentially in capital flowing to the emerging world. If we don't change the institutional setup, uh, this will not happen. So I will deposit my wish and come to a close. Thank you.
So thank you very much for that. Just to be clear, I haven't promised any delivery on wishes. Uh, you know. so, Doesn't stop us from making them, No, right? exactly, exactly. So we should make lots of wishes. Now, at my dinner table in the evening, we have lots of discussion about uh, climate data. My, my husband works in, in this field as well, so we have regular discussion on scope data, one, two, three, how to calculate them, and indeed the, the data challenge when it comes to climate is tremendous. Um, Moritz Kramer, you are Chief Economist at Country Risk IO, and um, I imagine that uh, for you this, this data issue is at the heart of, of a lot of uh, the work that, that you are doing. And I wonder, how do you think about this? How can we fill some of those gaps in the short term? Um, and, and how can we work around some of the issues that we have on the data uh, to build confidence also for both policymakers and investors? Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Um, I, it's a pleasure to be here with real people. It's wonderful. Thank you for being here. It's, um, maybe I should say a few words because Country Risk IO is maybe a tad less well known than BlackRock or, or, or the Bundesbank. Um, so this is actually uh, uh, an internet platform um, trying to make uh, sort of government or, or, or country ratings, uh, including sovereign ratings, ESG ratings, a public good by providing an easy to use platform um, for, for everyone. And the background to this is, is probably one of the reasons why I'm sitting here for almost two decades. Um, I was um, a, an, a ratings executive at S&P and, and running the, the sovereign ratings uh, team analytics uh, for the last couple of years. Um, and you're right, data is always, when you do analysis, a critical um, ingredient. But um, I think it's also very often um, a convenient excuse not to move. And actually, the data gaps or the data problems become less every day. I mean, we're making huge progress in modeling. Um, now you can say, well, you know, modeling is, you know, it depends on what kind of assumptions you do, you get the results that you want, and there's a de degree of truth to that, of course, but it's always been like this. There's nothing inherently new to this. Just as an example on climate change, for example, it was, um, I mean, the, the um, um, trying to, and I, and I look at all at these things still with a ratings angle, because that's just what I've been doing for so long. So um, trying to incorporate um, climate change into credit risk seemed like, like an impossible task because there are too many uncertainties. But actually, the number of uncertainties has declined and earlier this year, together with the team um, at the Bennett Institute in Cambridge, we've been, we've been doing some, some research and, and publishing some research where we've been, where we developed the first sort of uh, climate enhanced um, sovereign ratings. So it can be done and the results uh, were well, actually quite interesting if you, if you look at it from the ratings angle. So if you have no adjustment to climate policies by the year 2100, the average rating um, of the G7 countries would go down by three and a half notches. Now that's, you know, that's not catastrophic. The world goes on, but it's very, very significant. This is sort of equivalent to a Eurozone crisis to Eurozone sovereigns, probably a little bit more even. So uh, it is possible, but it's not happening. So uh, the, the established sort of guardians of credit risk, the rating agencies are not doing it. Why are they not doing it? There are two reasons. Uh, and the data availability is not one of them, as I just tried to, to explain. One of them is just sort of tradition or philosophy, and the other one is probably has something to do with the business model. So let's talk about the first one. What do what rating agencies do? And, and let me preface this by saying they're very important. While every self-respecting um, uh, investor would say, oh, I don't believe what they, what they do anyway, I know by experience that all of them want to talk to you and want to exchange views. Um, and uh, as passive investing becomes more important, the ratings become even more important because you, know, you have automatic reallocation of assets at a sometimes grand scale if the ratings change. So, so it matters. So why, why are they not, not taking this on board? Well, they talk a lot about um, uh, climate change and, 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 and the green economy and, and so on. The underlying philosophy of, of, of a credit rating is um, you rate what they call through the cycle. 
So you try to have like a steady hand, you know, you know, the interest rates go up and down, commodity prices go down and up, and, and you just look through this. And then, you know, you don't want to move in lockstep with the markets. And I think that's a very um, appropriate approach under normal circumstances, because you, if you just replicate what the market is telling you, there's no value added in having, having sort of an independent assessment of risk. But what, the challenges we're facing now are not cyclical, they're structural and they will take decades to really be completely felt. And it's not only climate change, it's probably more important from the credit risk for, for sovereigns, for example, is demographic change in many instances. Um, so, but as long as you look at sort of this rating through the cycle, your time horizon is way too short. In fact, the time horizon of a typical rating is maybe two to three years. So even shorter than a cycle in practice. So that's the rhetoric and, and the, and the and the actual uh, behavior um, is a little bit at odds here. So you don't really look out far enough. Um, but, but of course, there is the pressure to, to, to become sort of more, more visible in this field. So that's why you have this thicket of sort of green indices and ESG variables and green assessments and so on um, by the agencies as well. But I believe this is, you know, not really finding its way into the product that really matters for this allocation of capital, which is credit ratings. So it's a little bit of a sideshow. Um, you can make some money with it, but it's not really implementing the, um, uh, or impacting the rating. And as I described with our research, it is actually significant uh, potentially. So there is no yardstick for investors on the longer term. What is the credit risk as a, uh, in a world of global heating? There is not, although there could be. The other reason why it's probably not happening is, has to do with the business. No one is really interested in having that, other than maybe some people in this room and along this call. Why, why is no one interested? Well, the rating agencies are not very interested in it, because if you do it, you would have to tell your clients your rating is likely to go down, um, if, and that's not a good, good message to convey. You make your client unhappy, and maybe you lose them. So, um, you know, why would you say that in 20, 2040, 2050, your rating might go down by two or three notches? And we calculated and modeled that. So there's no interest here. Um, there's no interest in terms of the regulators. You know, if you look in Europe at ESMA or the SEC, what kind of interest would they have to force rating agencies to say, well, show us sort of what your um, long-term assessment is, although you, you said you know, the ECB tries to do that, but they, I, I can bet they're looking at corporates, they're not looking at governments, which really matters because it's with government bonds where everything stops, and we've seen this last year in, um, in COVID. This is what matters, the biggest asset class, and it's the asset class of last resort. So the regulators have no interest in forcing the rating agencies to do something that hurts their political master's ratings. And the third interesting the group that comes in here is actually the investors that you would think have an interest in these long-term credit assessments which are buy and hold investors pension funds insurance companies and so on they have enough problems right now so uh you know while they should they're not standing up and say look give us some long-term real risks what are we really holding in our books because that would make their financial situation even more difficult than it already is. So there is like a, a, a cartel of silence. No one is really interested in this. Everyone says it's important, um, but no one is taking any action. And it's not because of data. And that's sort of how, you, how I started and that's where, where your question started. The data availability is getting much better. And if you look at, at how, how the agencies work, you look at, you know, they're trying to assess contingent liability from a financial crisis. Now is financial crisis easier to predict than climate change, I would say no. I, I think we know climate change much better than when a, when a financial crisis hits, where and how. We are surprised every single time. Um, so it goes on that we have a, uh, a credit um, classification or rating of a two-year bond being exactly the same as, one, as a 50-year bond, saying the default risk is the same on both. That's patently implausible. We know it's not the case. We know that the, that the risks, and they're not cyclical, and that, that's sort of important. So before you could do this because there were cyclical risks. You know, you have oil prices going up and down. At the end, you're broadly in a similar situation where you were at the beginning, but here we're not. 
And Nick has shown that sort of very impressively. We're going into a paradigm shift. And, um, and the, um, the industry that should be showing what does this paradigm shift mean for credit risk in the biggest asset class in the, in the world, it's not happening. And I think that's a big, that's a data problem. Not that we can't do it, but the data problem is that it's not happening and therefore investors don't actually have anything to go on. I think that's a real problem. So certainly a, a few provocative thoughts there to, to think about. And I think you, you raise a very good point on distinguishing between the cyclical and, and the structural in these, in these discussions. Uh, because indeed it is uh, many of those structural changes um, that we're really beginning to see just right now. And it, it strikes me, you know, you also touched upon this, Philip. Um, when we look at the global economy today, our focus right now is on, on climate change and, and the transition related here too. But it strikes me that there are so many other changes also happening in, and so many other moving parts. Uh, we can just think about the fallout from the COVID crisis, how this has accelerated new working habits. We also see there is a, a very big discussion and, and no doubt a topic for different countries on, on the central bank digital currencies, which uh, I'm a little bit tempted to ask you about, Sabine, because I think you know this is another very big transition in the making. Um, we also see that consumers themselves are, are thinking about new ways of living, new ways of spending. We have a big discussion going on on global supply chains, how to organize them. And then on top of all of this, we also have a broader digital transition. So I have this chart where I try to put all these moving pieces up and I have a lot of engineers in my team. And uh, when I do my chart of all these moving wheels, they tell me it's clear you're an economist because it cannot possibly be that all these wheels can move in the right way at the same time. And only an economist would think that's possible. Um, but this is where my wish side comes into the equation. Um, I thought we'd open up for a, a few questions. We have a little bit of time left. Ernest, I don't know on the chat if we have some questions. Yes, we do. I have a question which is uh, here in the chat, which is maybe both for Philip Hildebrandt and for Moritz Kremer. Following up a bit on Moritz Kremer's points, how big a problem is greenwashing in your practical experience? How to counter it? Uh, I think it's a big problem um, and, and it's understandable because investors are clamoring for, for green bonds. I mean, I've been, been fairly critical of, of green bonds um, because they're not really reflecting what an issuer does overall, but they're just reflecting a small part of it. And, and one thing that I found really interesting just two weeks ago, I think it was a headline that Saudi Arabia is going to issue its first green bond. Um, I'm not saying um, this to, to, to belittle Saudi Arabia's effort to, to diversify away from, from, um, um, from hydrocarbons, but the justification had nothing to do with, um, with any green investments. The, the motivations were to touch new investor bases, to get better funding conditions, and so on. So it, they didn't even pretend that this was sort of part of, of a shift. So I think... Um, the risk here is that this will breed cynicism when we have all these green bonds being issued left, right, and center. Um, and and, and, I, and I, I think greenwashing is, is a real problem. And that's why the independent arbiters um, are, are very important. And the, and the market sort of for green ratings is, of course, so still in its infancy of regulation. I think that's an urgency that there is some order being installed here. Sabine, sitting in a central bank, would you like to sort of pick up on this topic as well. How concerned are you at the, at the, at the European system of central banks uh, about this topic? Well, I think um, the debate about greenwashing comes to the right time because we are now seeing an increasing interest in investing in sustainable uh, flows. So um, clearly we do not have, we are not ready uh, on, do not have uh, in place uh, ESG regulation to definitely, um, you know, define this is uh, what we understand as being sustainable. We are in the beginning, we have um, taxonomy was one uh, term we heard and a lot of green bond standards in the EU and so on. So we see a lot of things happening there. So, but I think that the, the, the core of the debate is, is you know, ESG really supporting 
the transition. I think this is the whole point. And we hear argument, you know, we hear, well, that's all green labeling, it's greenwashing, and so, of course, I mean, I would be cautious. First of all, I think, of course, real impact investment is something different than just saying, okay, this fulfills certain ESG criteria. But, and this is, I think, very important, if you have green bonds, be it on the sovereign level, like the Netherlands, France, Germany, uh, and other many other countries, you know, you do not see additional green investments because the budgets, the fiscal budgets have been decided already in the past. So what you do is you just look in your, um, your, your political decisions, say, okay, this is green, this is social, and so on. So we do not have further sustainable investment, but it shows that sovereigns or corporates have understood that sustainability matters to the market. So it has a signaling effect. It shows the market that this company or this uh, government has understood that sustainability matters. And so let me put it that way. It is a good starting point, but it's certainly not impact investment. Thank you. Philip, did you want to jump yeah, in? Yeah, I could just add it, it's a challenge for the industry. It's, um, I would also say that if you get caught out, and we've had a case of a major asset manager in Europe who ran into problems with the commission, this is, you know, it can be very costly, both from a reputation perspective, but also from a business perspective. So there are real incentives, if you're serious about sustainable investing, to do everything you can to avoid falling into that trap. Now, it's... It's a difficult story because everything is evolving. Uh, we have some regulation now, very helpful in Europe. I think the new regulation defines what can be labeled sustainable. So that's a good start. And we're actually very grateful for that because in a sense it makes, makes it easier to adjust the product range in, in Europe. We don't have this in the US. So in the US it's, it's a moving target. Um, the, as we said, the analytics, the data is, is evolving. I'm also not so pessimistic about this. I think you know, we're heading in the right direction, but it's also a moving target. So the best thing you can do as, a, as an asset manager is just to put out a lot of transparency, to really say what it means when you label a product uh, sustainable. And if you look at our ETF platform, for instance, we, we list exactly on the on the web page for every product, every ETF we have, you can see what it is, how much of a CO2 reduction is implied by a particular ETF being called sustainable, what kind of upgrade you have on other ESG factors. So I think the answer for us as an industry right now is in a sense to, to be very positive towards regulation that stipulates uh, the definitions and at the same time really be very transparent so that the client sees and the regulators they see what we label a sustainable product and why. And that's the approach we're taking. But I think we have to expect that this is a, we're on a journey here. This is only the very, very beginning. And in fact, everything you've said about sovereign risk, you know, uh, reconfirms my hypothesis that we're at the very beginning of this. Uh, this is only the beginning of a vast reallocation of capital. And this notion that the market is perfectly efficient and everything is already priced in is just nonsense. I mean, I've learned the hard way during the financial crisis that the market efficiency hypothesis uh, cannot be right. And, and I think as we've heard from you, Nick, today, uh, that's not true here either. And, and so, you know, we're at the very beginning of this long transition. Thank you very much. Um, and indeed, uh, I, 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 having been through a few market crises myself and a few moments of exuberance, uh, I, I think we can all agree here that uh, this idea that markets price perfectly in a smooth, nice way and can be used as a disciplining force uh, doesn't quite work out. I they tend say, you know, risks were highest when the spreads were lowest exactly. uh, running into 2008. <laughs> so that tells you something that the market wasn't exactly. uh, prescient. They're, they're there when you, when you don't want them to be, and when you want them to be there, they're not quite there. So it's a, indeed quite a challenging situation. I'm, I'm conscious of time, Ernest. I don't know if we have time for one or two more questions. Yes, we do. Uh, should, I, should I just bring them 
up so front. Why don't, why don't you throw the questions yeah. out and then we'll allow everyone to react to them. And if there's a question in the room as well, we can... Uh... I think I have three interesting questions here and you choose whichever you find uh, suitable to answer to. The first question is addressed to Sabina Maurerer. Is the ECB's strategy to tackle climate change legitimized by its mandate? <laughs> then there is another question to Moritz Kramer, Philipp Hildebrandt, and maybe also Ms. Maudara. How abrupt might the adjustment in the business outlook for brown industries uh, be? What should creditors and stockholders be aware of? Might it be wise to withdraw from these industries early to guard against unpleasant sudden surprises? And then I have a question um, for Helmut List. A technological progress is also a function of the scale of an industry. Have we passed the critical mass in e-mobility for a massive boost in R&D to ensure that batteries and motors will be will in the near future no longer be the technical, economic, nor ecological bottleneck for e-mobility. Could we expect some sort of herd behavior into green technology once the train is running? Well, what I, I, I think uh, let's start by, by picking up on the last question and, and bring in Professor List. Uh, Professor, do you think we are reaching that, that tipping point on technology? Well, I think we see today a good uh, positive gradient, a quite a big gradient uh, towards uh, battery electric uh, uh, electrification. I think that's a good sign. Uh, of course, at the, today we have to look at, at what um, there's quite some, of course, money uh, invested in support of the buyer or the producer of those cars which of course will not be sustainable for the long run. So the key is to get the momentum and use the momentum to uh, improve uh, batteries, to make them both more affordable, but also to make them uh, more green at the same time, which today there is no, no incentive to do that, which should be probably also improved. Uh, but I see very positive in, uh, move in investment. We see in Europe, but it's very important that the cells, which are the core of the battery, of course, uh, are getting produced in Europe more and more. We do no longer import all of them, but the portion of production in Europe is key. And that is moving forward. Are we, what is tipping point? Tipping point ideally would be where no further support would be needed, but we are far away from that. We need this further support, I think. And what I think is key that also the research side gets good support in those areas, which takes place, but could be done to a large extent. And positive is that we will see the momentum and it will go forward in a, in a good way. But of course, it needs to be fast enough so that we can, in Europe, uh, lead the way uh, compared to other nations. And, but I think we are not in a good, good role, I would say. So, Professor, if I can take this opportunity to ask you to make your 2022 climate wish. I would wish that we can see a sound and sustainable downturn in CO2 as a fact. And uh, this happening in the Next cup within the next couple of years, and that it is due to not overcoming another crisis, but uh, that it is true, uh, or because of a crisis, but it is true to a true, uh, let's say, uh, successful implementation of CO2 neutral and highly efficient technologies. Thank you so, so much. To support the uh, the preservation of a livable environment for our children. Thank you very much, Professor. Sabine, the ECB's mandate is yes. climate change within it, and I'll get you to give a wish at the end as well. Right. Uh, I was, uh, would also like to take a little bit on the, the concern about the bond industry. Maybe I start with that, uh, because this strikes me the most. Um, the mandate is very clear, so I can start with the more striking one. 
Um, the question was, well, is it uh, how likely is the climate risk to materialize uh, towards uh, the brown industry? First question, what is brown industry? I guess it's meant uh, by CO2 intensive activities. So um, let me put it very clearly. Um, the, risk that the, the risk is getting higher the more we see political inactivity. You know, what the, the industry need is certainty, planning certainty, and they need time to adjust. We need transition. So in order to allow the industry to transfer to carbon and Nick said it, all the industry need to adjust to get to net zero. But how are they going to make it? And we need all industry because otherwise we will see social tensions and we will not get the society to back our transformation policies. So therefore, it's one, one, once again very important to see political decisions now. Um, the question whether you know we would recommend to divest first of all central bankers do no not at all give advices how you spend your money but um i think you trigger a very important point is about how to deal with brown industries it is not in our interest that you know we just uh, call brown industry as a no-go as of today our goal should be to encourage or to mobilize, be it by regulation, by carbon pricing, or what, in whatever way, is to get them on the journey to net zero. That should be our, um, our goal. Uh, now the, uh, the question about the mandate. I have expected this question, and I'm very glad that uh, one of the audience raised it, because this is a very valid question, and we've dealt with it. You know, all of you know that our Bundesbank is known to be very traditional in keeping on its mandate, what is price stability, and therefore, of course, we have thought about this question very thoroughly. And as I said in the beginning, climate change has a big impact on our mandates. And as I try to, to explain, we see a price dynamic because, or we will see it, uh, because of climate policy. But even the, the climate events we saw have already an impact on prices like food prices, housing prices, and so on. So price stability is, you know, be affected. The same as for financial uh, stability. I, you know, we are all talking about the financial risk and banking supervision as well. You know, um, we have to, to ensure that the banking industry is resilient against climate change. And therefore, it's in our minute. Maybe to make it on a broader level very clear, central banks always come from a risk perspective not from a proactive perspective in doing climate policy, but rather asking, oh my God, there is a new risk on the horizon. How are we going to deal with that? And that's the way why we are responsible. Thank you very much. And your wish. My wish is uh, plain but difficult. <laughs> uh, I would love to see G20 and G7 next year, Germany and Indonesia, to manage to get to a common ground for carbon taxation on a global level. Thank you. That is a difficult one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Moritz, some thoughts from you and uh, perhaps also a closing wish on, yeah. on what you'd like to see. Yeah, very briefly. I mean, on whether to run away from brown industries or brown issues. Um, as an economist, I think sort of in, in, in increments. You know? So if you going back to, to the Saudi Arabia example, if they sort of want to issue a billion dollars to cover like uh, 20 square kilometers of, of, of desert with solar panels, I would say by all means. Right. So it's really, are they becoming greener or brown? At the same time, you can have a company which is considered to be carbon friendly, um, doing something that is less so. So it's really sort of the on the margin that you would have to look at. Just running away um, wholesale, I think, is not a good investment strategy. It's also very disruptive, I think, for our economies and, and societies. So I, I, would, um, I, I would really look at a case-by-case -case, um, basis here. Um, 
the wish, well, there have been quite a number of wishes for 22. So I have a wish for 21, um, and uh, and that is that um, at the COP26 in Glasgow, the governments and the world leaders really come up with with credible plans, and they they don't only sort of throw a number in the room, but they start to flesh it out a little bit more clearly how they want to get there. Um, that's an easy one, I guess. Thank you. <laughs> well, we'll see what happens soon on that one. <laughs> So with that, I think our, our time has come to a close, and I'd like to thank the panelists for sharing many thoughts. Also, uh, both uh, the panelists here in the room and also the panelists uh, with us uh, in, in uh, what I always think of virtual, but of course that's probably not quite the right word. Um, it's been uh, very enjoyable uh, to have this discussion, and I think what I really take away is uh, two key things. The idea that this transformation is really something that's with us for a very long time. But the second idea being that it's something that's beginning to happen now and actually in quite a big way. So the idea that this is something for 2030, 40, 50, 60 is, is not right. This is something for 21, to take your point, Norris, 22, 23. And I think it's happening now. Thank you very much, everyone. And I will hand over now to Harald Mara for some closing comments. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. As you recognize, I am not uh, Mr. Mara. Uh, he needed, unfortunately, to stay in bed. Don't worry, it's not COVID. Uh, we are all tested, and I was asked to, on his behalf, try to, in a few words, it won't take more than an hour, uh, to bring uh, the session to a closer. I think it was fascinating, and I would like to congratulate the team from SWEF and from the UNB having brought such a high-level group together with really strong and very, very interesting comments, sir. Starting out, of course, with sir. Nick here in this presentation, and I hope some of you will be able to follow up tomorrow uh, when he is also putting this in one in academic context, and it's uh, certainly worthwhile to read through his slides. As I mentioned before, I think I would summarize uh, what he said there because there was no disagreement is to say climate change is the growth story. I think everybody agrees how to say that there this is what we, whether we want it or not, we do it anyhow. And if we do it well, it will be a growth story. If we don't do it well, we may survive, but if we won't get the growth we would like to have. Now, from the many very good interventions, the question now is what I distilled, it's my personal one, out of the different uh, uh, comments which were made there, starting out with the European Union. Mauro, and also, as he put it in his wish, what he would like to have is, we made a great program, the policymakers should sign off to it, and let's go. I would say yes, that's an interesting perspective, but I'm not so sure that there yet, how to say, the program which came together has been sufficiently discussed in all technical details, but most importantly in the political details. So I would also think a process along these lines, which bring a nevertheless very strong program to the table, would be useful in order to avoid, sir, how to say, rejections by the uh, public uh, of the European Union. But that action is needed. I think this is non-controversial. Second part, ECB, which just heard, uh, and here uh, Sabine speaking uh, uh, for the ECB here, is uh, I think uh, the thing she mentioned at the beginning, a really correct one. We are in the, in the game because we are very much uh, Dutch based through price uh, developments, uh, uh, through any kind of uh, other elements in the second, second, third order degree. And what she also mentioned is, and we believe it, because I think uh, as an independent institution, we are able uh, to broker concepts, but also perhaps broker some of the processes there. And I think that's an important uh, aspect to it. And this applies also, if you want so, to the IMF, which, uh, of course, uh, works closely together with uh, 
central banks, the Minister of Finance. Uh, and uh, what uh, Celia has uh, discussed uh, was quite uh, interesting, uh, only to take one part of it, when she said, how high are the implicit subsidies there? Five to six trillion. Well, spending should be relatively easily found if only in a share of this money were to be used not for subsidies, but were to be used in order to finance uh, uh, the uh, climate change. Uh, we had a number of institutions which gave good advice uh, uh, to uh, the few people who actually will do the change, which is entrepreneurs, and I was happy to have a Professor List here, because, uh, uh, of course, he always shines perhaps larger in Austria, but he is really one of the key institutions, inventors, starting out until recently being the most important uh, diesel motor producer in the world, but only the small ones, but the big ones for ships and other parts of it. And I was astonished to hear that uh, they're already at 70% uh, electricity there. And so already he, as a producer of an industry, contributor to the industry, has made a major change. But one of the things which struck me most, because uh, perhaps it resonates with me well, is the question of our government. Please, you can do the uh, assignment or selection of the targets. We will try to follow. But please let the economy and let the, uh, the engineers do the technological choices. What is the best? I think that's a critical part. Uh, uh, not to pre prescribe uh, uh, technologies, let it open and let the best win within the rules. I think this was a critical contribution. And last but not least, uh, what we heard here from, uh, how to say, uh, uh, key uh, people working on financial markets, uh, uh, Philip Hildebrand and Fritz Kramer, was uh, to say, uh, Philip said, well, we will have the biggest capital reallocation the world has ever seen, if I quote you correctly. And uh, uh, Fritz, you also uh, to said that there are key elements there. If and as we want to bring uh, changes to the developing world, it will to happen through the financial markets. But what you both also expressed very clearly is, uh, perhaps it resonates all with me, you know, we need the financial markets but we are not so sure that the efficiency hypothesis works so well. Which, of course, raises the question, what to do? How can we establish uh, the mechanism of capital relocation given what we currently have there? Who are then the drivers? We certainly don't want to have, how to say, the government decide how much money goes to the South. I think uh, by itself, this would not be okay. But also, we cannot only rely on the financial markets to make this choice, or at least, uh, uh, how to say, without clear, what is it also, public uh, sector guidance, which may come from the G7, from the G20 or other institution, but without that, it will not happen. And in addition there, uh, it's not only an economic question there, how do you take the money from the north to the south. What we also have is uh, we have a problem of legal instruments to bring it uh, to from the north to the south. The eminent group of experts, I think 2018 or 90, produced the reports in which it was clearly laid out there if and as we want to bring uh, Again, capital to the south, we need to have the correct instruments to make it happen. But for the time being, I haven't seen too much progress in this area, and it will be needed. With that, I to say, uh, let me go back where we started from with Schumpeter, which is that Schumpeter said there that uh, the, the, uh, the dynamism of uh, Capitalism is uh, creative destruction, but of course this is a necessary condition. Uh, the other conditions there 
require quite some additional thinking and uh, additional work. But uh, every travel starts with a small step. And what we had uh, this week uh, uh, in Austria, we started with a very small step, uh, but hope others will follow in other countries. And I want to thank you again for your participation, for your very good comments there. I hope everything will be noted and also written up uh, so we can share it to some extent. And uh, with this, uh, as they say in English, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much.